Hello, everyone. As you get all signed in, welcome, welcome. I see some familiar faces and then some new ones, too. Um, we'll give everyone a few minutes to kind of roll on in. We'll admit them from the waiting room. Um, but as we let them come in uh, a little bit, just about yappy yeah, hour, if you haven't attended before, welcome to your first time. Uh, please keep your mic muted uh, throughout the main topic uh, and we'll cover leash reactivity and dog aggression first. Um, it's kind of different this time. Usually it's a little bit more relaxed, but this time we have such a big in-depth topic that I actually created a PowerPoint deck for you. Nice. Um, so that's super fun and different, um, but feel free to use the chat button uh, down at the bottom of the screen if you have a question that pops into your mind um, that you want me to address. Um, we had some great questions submitted um, ahead of time. And then once I kind of finish an overview of the topic, we'll open it up for Q&A. Uh, my colleague Mia will help me go through any questions that popped up in chat um, and also go through the questions that were sent in ahead of time. Um, so yeah, let me know if you have any yeah, questions in chat. Say hi, tell me your dog's name, breed. You might hear my new puppy Fozzie bark and move around. You wanna say hi? Some of you saw him when he was tiny and he's getting so much bigger now. He's ginormous, extra long. So he might be making some noise today, but hopefully after his long walk, he'll just take a nap and settle down, so. Okay. And then as a thank you for attending our Yappy Hours, uh, we do offer a great discount um, for our Puppy Essentials workshops. We have five different topics now with more coming soon. Um, my favorite is the Socialization Foundations because it's all about socializing puppies, which can be tough in COVID times. So lots of ideas there for you. But we also have crate training, potty training, nipping and biting, um, which I'm dealing with with my teething puppy. And then also one all about barking. Um, so you get $10 off with the code YAPPY10 and that expires at the end of November. So go ahead and sign up for those as soon as you can to take advantage of that. And then one last thing before we dive in, and this is pretty important because we're talking about something today that really does require connecting with a certified trainer um, or professional and so we actually just launched our virtual one-on-one -on -one training uh, with me through Preventive Vet, um, where it's all virtual and we can really dive into your unique situation with your dog, because every dog's an individual. So especially with things like leash reactivity and aggression, your training plan really needs to be personalized to you and your dog and your situation. Um, so we do, we do all of those things virtually, and it's actually, I found virtual training is really great for dogs who might be scared or nervous around new people. Um, and so working virtually has been fantastic for those clients of mine. Okay. So today we are talking about leash reactivity, dog aggression, something that's really common, <laughs> more common than you might think. Um, I'm gonna talk about what reactivity is, why it happens, the reasons we know why it happens, um, I'll also talk about the difference between reactivity and aggression. Um, and then we'll also be covering some things of how to prevent reactivity from developing. Perhaps you have a puppy or a dog who doesn't show reactivity and want to make sure you prevent that from becoming an issue. Um, or maybe one of your dogs is reactive, but the other one isn't. So you want to make sure the other one doesn't learn bad habits from the reactive dog. We'll also talk a little bit about pulling on leash and leash walking. In the questions that came in ahead of time, a lot of people were asking about what to do when their dog pulls on leash. And it is a behavior that happens with leash reactive dogs, but it doesn't mean your dog is reactive. So I wanted to make sure we kind of knew the difference and how to tell, you know, is this part of their reactivity or is it just, you know, some leash manners I need to work on? So we'll be covering that for you. And then I'll be talking about what tools you can use that will help manage your reactive dog to make walks easier. I'll also cover what tools not to use, what to avoid when training a reactive dog. And then I'll kind of give you an overview of what a behavior plan would look like. So if you were my client or you went to a certified trainer or behavior consultant, what kind of behavior modification plan we would set you up on for your dog's reactivity. And that's gonna be a kind of a broad overview because like I said, every dog is unique 
They have different things that make them reactive. They have different lifestyles, different environments. So everything really needs to be personalized, but you'll kind of see what a trainer would do for you. And then I'll give you some ideas of what you can start doing right away to help your reactive dog and start to enjoy your walks again when you take them out and about. So let me get my fun little slide deck ready here. Maybe. I want to make sure you guys have the right one. Perfect. Okay. So what is reactivity, right? It's a term that has definitely become more used over the last few years. Um, and we define it as an overreaction from a dog to a particular stimuli. So something in their environment. This is usually people other dogs, especially certain objects or even sounds. And this is an overreaction. This isn't just kind of like, a, oh, I noticed that thing and I bark at it once or twice. And I found a quote from Pat Miller, a great certified trainer um, that I just loved because it really defined what reactivity is. Um, and it says the reactive dog doesn't just get excited. He spins out of control to a degree that he can harm himself or others around him. So that's a big part of it. They kind of lose control. They don't even know where they're at, who's around them. So oftentimes we get some redirected bites um, from that. And she continues, in his maniacal response to the stimulus that set him off, he's oblivious to anyone's efforts to intercede and he goes nuclear. So I love that last point, that going nuclear. It's like your dog just can't hear you it's almost like they can't see you, right? They just lose their mind and they lose all control in that re overreaction to whatever it was that entered their environment. So reactive dogs, they might bark, they growl, they lunge, they might snap and bite if something's close enough. Um, they often jump, right? They're jumping and lunging at the end of the leash. They might just seem really hyper vigilant, like just hyper aware of everything that's going on around them. Or there's also the reactivity where they show really fearful behavior, so really panicked, uh, fearful behavior, trying to hide behind you, trying to run away, trying to get away from the thing that scares them. And I see reactive behavior mostly on leash, um, but it can also happen behind a barrier, which is something we call barrier frustration. And if you think about those two things, they're really related. Um, if you're on a leash, they have a barrier. They can't get where they wanna go or they can't run if they wanna choose the flight option of fight and flight. Um, so it's a barrier in a way. And then if you have a fence, right? This is often where I see it. Something's on the other side they can't get to and they want to interact or they want that thing to go away. So they're barking and a little bit territorial. But it really is the overreaction in those contexts that I look for when I'm looking to determine if it's reactivity or just some you know, lack of self-control, lack of some training um, that we need to work on there. So dogs become reactive for a variety of reasons. You know, one of these things or multiple um, of these things and things like genetics do play a factor. Um, fear and anxiety. So if they have generalized anxiety, they tend to be much more reactive. There can be what's called single event learning, which is they had one negative experience and their brain imprinted on that experience. And then they think whenever I see that thing, that happened to be there, I'm going to react out of fear and anxiety because I don't want to experience that again, right? So single event learning can create reactivity even if it only happened once. Um, so this is where we do see some dogs who might have gotten in a dog fight or attacked by an off-leash dog, something like that. We see them then in the future react with that overreaction because they're freaked out and they want that thing to leave them alone. It can also happen just out of built up frustration uh, so this is less common than fear and anxiety, but I have seen it where a dog starts off so excited to see someone, a person or another dog, and they want to interact, right? And then they never get to interact. And so it builds up into frustration. And then that switches over into reactivity where they just can't control their brain anymore. They can't control their actions. So they're overreacting to the fact that a dog is there, right? 
I tend to see this more when there's been a lot of negative associations built in response to wanting to interact. So if a dog wants to greet a dog and say it's a five month old puppy and every five month old puppy wants to like greet everything, then they get a pop on the leash or they get yelled at, right? Most likely they're making the association of I see a dog and then something happens to me that I don't like, that's uncomfortable or painful. And over time, those negative associations build up to a negative emotional response to that trigger, right? So we want to make sure we're not creating negative associations for our dog. I've also seen reactivity happen because of overstimulation. There's just too much in the environment for the dog to deal with, and they don't have enough coping skills um, or resiliency to deal with that. And so it just stacks up on them, and then they respond with uh, reactivity to a certain item that was just, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back, right? One more thing, and they just lose their mind. And then there's been some really cool uh, recent studies that show anxiety and then reactivity um, can actually be caused by nutritional deficiencies in a dog's diet. Um, so sometimes we look at what the dog is eating uh, to determine if we can switch that up um, after consulting with their veterinarian and see if that helps kind of calm their, their gut biome down a little bit to help with anxiety. So... Reactivity versus aggression. This is a tough one because they overlap a lot. Um, but reactive behavior doesn't mean that a dog is necessarily aggressive, right? Um, both reactivity and aggression are most often rooted in fear. Um, but aggression is a little different in that there's lots of causes that could be um, contributing to aggressive behavior, um, such as resource guarding, um, frustration, just like reactivity, um, territorial behavior. So other things that contribute to aggression versus reactivity, not necessarily territorial uh, per se. So things like that. But if reactivity in a dog isn't addressed, if you don't start modifying that behavior, it will result in aggressive behavior. And you'll see in a few slides here kind of the scale um, of a dog's reactivity, and it does end in a bite, right? Um, so if we let the dog keep reacting, 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 and just escalating the situation, it does end with aggressive behavior. So we don't want that to happen. So we want to kind of cut it off when, uh, before they're really even reacting. Another way when I'm working with a client with a reactive dog, if I'm trying to determine whether it's aggression or simply reactivity, I always look at the intent of the dog. And this is determined a lot by canine body language and then the context that they're in. Um, but aggression is really the intent on the dog's part to cause harm to someone or something versus reactivity tends to be just, I want to make that thing go away, right? I want it to leave me alone. It freaks me out, right? And so I'm going to make this big display because in the past that's worked, right? When I barked and I've lunged at somebody, they're like, Ooh, and they cross the street, right? And they walk the other way. It's adding distance. And for reactivity, that tends to be the main goal of dogs who are overreacting um, in that situation. So there is a lot of overlap there, but you, you want to make sure if you have a dog who is reactive that you don't automatically label them aggressive. Um, you really want to work with a professional who can help you drill down on, on the intent behind their behavior and then address the underlying cause of the reactivity or aggression, whatever it might be. Preventing reactivity. <laughs> so I gave you that list of all the things we know can cause reactivity, uh, but we can't know the exact reason for each dog. We're not in their brain, um, but there could also be other reasons. You know, we might do everything right and we still end up with a reactive dog. That's okay. <laughs> you can still do a lot to try to prevent reactivity from developing. Um, socialization is going to be your number one thing um, and correctly socializing. So making sure you don't overwhelm your puppies and young dogs with experiences that then they build up just that overstimulation. They don't know what to do with themselves. So really creating positive associations with seeing new things. You know, dog walks around the corner. Oh, good job. Here's a treat from me. Right. And so you're teaching them something startles you, but it ends up with treats falling from the sky. So building those associations is especially important when your puppy's in their socialization period, which is around eight weeks to around 16 weeks. That is a very important window to make sure you're socializing your puppy. 
And we also wanna teach them what to do instead of reacting when they see another dog. And this is something I'm actually working with my puppy with now, uh, cause he's a herding breed and he alert barks. Whenever he sees a dog suddenly appear, he goes, Hoof! right? And so now I'm starting to teach him, you know, instead of barking, if you see that dog, look at me. So I use name recognition, right? Or I use touch. And he does that and he gets a click and a treat. Good job. And then he looks back at the other dog, looks right back at me. Yes, good job. So I'm teaching him what to do instead of alert barking, right? So he doesn't have what I would call reactivity yet. He's not out of control. He's still able to think. But I want to work on preventing it from escalating and becoming his reactive response whenever he sees a dog in the distance. So it does take some work when they're young, but it is so worth it to do it when they're younger and prevent as much unwanted behavior rather than react to the reactivity. <laughs> One thing too, and this is important in the treatment, which we'll get into a little bit later, is providing lots of mental enrichment and then physical exercise uh, that your puppy and your dog needs. So we're really working their brain um, with lots of food puzzles, training sessions, giving them a job to do, and then working their natural instincts is so important to just burn excess energy and prevent that energy from building up, right? Um, and then the physical exercise is important as well. Again, you're just burning energy. So pulling on leash versus leash reactivity. I look at this as why is the dog pulling? Um, so it's normal for a lot of dogs to pull because it's worked for them. <laughs> so most dogs pull to get somewhere and especially if they're a large breed dog it works <laughs> for the most part they usually are like I want to go sniff that bush and you're coming with me right so I look at why is the dog pulling do they want to go sniff do they want to go greet the other dog so I look at the body language that they're giving me I look at any you know other behaviors they're exhibiting. Are they getting tense? Are they starting to whine or bark? Are they, is their arousal level, their energy level kind of going up to a point where you're like, ooh, this is about to not be good. That's more on the reactivity side versus the happy-go-lucky dog who's like, I'm so excited for that person. I wanna go, I'm gonna go pull them. I'm gonna pull you to get to them, right? They're just, they're just wiggly and happy. That's just a lack of self-control and a little bit of lack of training. So teaching them positive, <laughs> walking skills is really important. Um, and working on leash walking skills is important too for reactive dogs. So you want to have a little bit more control there. But they are different. So I look at what tools I'm using for leash walking. Um, I never walk a dog on a collar um, just because of the pressure on the neck. Instead, I use a harness. Um, and if you have a harness that is a back attachment that attaches to the back, I see that really kind of encourage the dog to pull. Um, when they're on their harness. And so what I recommend is front attachment. So if you can see here, the top colored part of this harness that I have is would be on the back of the dog, their head would be here. And then there is a ring on the front that I attach the leash to. And so using the right tools when you're walking your dog can help passively train them. And what I like about the front attachment is it gives you control of your dog's center of gravity. And so if they pull ahead, the leash pressure is actually going to turn them to the side, right? The side that the leash is on. So instead of what they've learned, oh, pulling gets me somewhere, pulling actually gets me further away from the thing that I wanted. And so that's helping you passively train. I also find that it's a lot easier for me to um, control a larger dog with a front attachment harness. Um, and I'll talk about some other ways for large breeds uh, to use tools. Um, because it helps minimize the pressure on my shoulder. So if the dog kind of jerks ahead, it's less like straight out and it's a little bit easier on me. I'm only five feet, um, yet I have walked many a large dogs using the right tools. So think about what you're using for your dog when you're working on leash walking skills, what you can use to make it easier on you and to also help you passively train. And then spend lots of time practicing your leash walking skills. Start somewhere really low distraction, like your house or your apartment, right, in the kitchen. It does not have to be a large area. If you have a yard and it's an okay weather day, then practice out in your yard, right? Start somewhere where they're not gonna be distracted, they're more familiar with the environment, and then reward them for paying attention to you, right? Looking at you while they're on leash, right? Name recognition is one of my favorite things for leash walking, because I use it if I see a dog getting too far and they're about to be pulling on leash, I go, Suki, and then they look and then they're not pulling. Right, and then they're back 
kind of in the circle that I want them in. So rewarding them for what we want. And then if they're pulling on leash a lot to greet somebody or to try to greet another dog, um, then you want to practice calm and polite greetings while on leash. Um, and this can take some work, especially if you have a really young puppy. So it really is, this is where having group classes is fantastic, even though right now it's a little harder to get in-person group classes. Um, but meeting with a trainer one-on-one -on -one who can use themselves as a decoy or a, an appropriate dog as a decoy to practice teaching your dog you get to greet that dog if you don't pull me there, right? So if you can control yourself, if you can give me a sit or you can give me a touch or a look at me, right? Then we'll keep getting closer to the dog. But if you can, if you get overexcited and start to pull, we're actually gonna go further away, right? So this is using positive reinforcement, rewarding them with interaction if they're doing what we want. And it's also using negative punishment. We're taking away the thing they want in order to make pulling decrease. Right? but we're teaching them what to do instead of pulling. Um, so practicing regular loose leash walking, low distraction areas, and then practicing polite and calm greetings. Get a friend or family member um, to practice as, a, as your decoy. It's really helpful to do that. And in the follow-up email, you will get lots of resources that kind of go more in depth on each of these things as well. If you're just dealing with leash pulling, um, there's some resources in there for you. So, now on to the tools I use for reactive dog cases. Harness, I use a harness for reactivity. I do not want any pressure on the dog's neck um, when I am working with a reactive dog. This increases stress chemicals and hormones in the brain. And so I want something that's more comfortable and isn't going to cause discomfort or pain um, in this situation. I really like the Freedom No Pull Harness. Um, the Perfect Fit Harness is another great one. And then the Blue Nine Balance Harness is also great. I like these because they're actually a T-shaped harness. So instead of going across the shoulders, they go um, between the legs and then around um, to connect. And I also like them because they have a front ring for attaching the leash, as well as one on the back. And I like having two points of contact, especially for the large breed dogs that are reactive. As you can see here, we have Gunther. I love Gunther. I miss Gunther, I haven't seen him in a while. Um, he is a St. Bernard Mastiff mix who was extremely reactive, um, tending towards the aggression um, on that back end of reactivity. Partly due to genetics, he is a breed that is bred to be protective and on the alert. Um, so his mom would actually get dragged down on her knees and then dragged across the street in his effort to go after the other dogs. So highly, highly reactive. And she used a front attachment harness um, and then a double ended leash. And she attached the leash to the front of the harness. And then she also used a head. So something like a halty um, or gentle leader are probably the two most common uh, brands of that. She attached the other leash there. So she had more control over his power, right? So the front of the harness was more of her brake versus the head control, a lot like a bridle on a horse, is giving her more control over direction that he's going. So she felt a lot more comfortable walking him um, during our practice sessions um, because she felt she had better control. The one thing with the head collars is they do need prior training. Do not just shove a head collar on your dog and be like, cool, let's go out for a walk. You're gonna end up with a dog who's like, get this thing off my face, right? And then it's like they're having a seizure just trying to get it off and everyone's staring at you and you're like, it's fine. <laughs> so you wanna make sure you desensitize, you acclimate your dog to wearing this new tool, making sure they, en they enjoy wearing it. Treats always happen when this thing's on my face, it's great. And kind of learning how to respond to the pressure. I also don't recommend head collars for smaller breeds. Um, it's very dependent on the dog I'm working with if I will use a head collar because if they don't have a, a strong neck and if they do jerk to the end of the leash, they're gonna whip their head to the side. Um, so I do not use them with very slim uh, neck dogs or slim head dogs or small breeds. I don't use them at all. Um, so it's very dependent on the breed, but in most cases I will rely on a harness, both front attachment um, and back attachment. You will also need a clicker or marker word. So you want to tell your dog what it is that's getting them the reward. And this is gonna be very important for the treatment of reactivity. If you've clicker trained before, use a clicker. They're super powerful for dogs who understand what the click means. But in most cases for reactive dogs, I actually just rely on a marker word. So my marker word is yes, and then a treat happens. 
always followed by a treat. And using a word is a lot easier because it frees up one of your hands. And so it's a lot more comfortable. You kind of feel like you need as many hands as you, as you can get when you're working in dog training. So not having an extra tool that you need to learn how to use is, is really helpful. You can always use a marker word. Then you also want to have the highest value of treats uh, for your dog, right? In a little treat pouch, ready to grab as you go. Uh, different treats for different dogs. Some dogs like, you know, fresh chicken. Other dogs like the crunchy stuff. So your dog determines what is their highest value treat, and you want to make sure you have lots of those ready for your reactivity training sessions and on your regular walks. Probably the most important thing you need for reactivity, a tool in your toolkit, is situational awareness. Um, this is where you have to be very aware of what's in your environment. Your dog will almost always know ahead of you that a dog is coming because they can smell them, right? But if you're on your phone or talking to a friend, you might miss the moment that you could have a great training opportunity and you miss it and then your dog's reacting, right? Or you're not paying attention and all of a sudden the trigger is really close and you didn't think, oh, I could have just crossed the street, right? So head on a swivel when you're working with a reactive dog. Um, this is so important for safety. And safety is my top priority when I'm working with reactive dogs, both for the dog itself, the handler um, that they have, and then any other dogs or people that we're working around. And that's where I get into the muzzle training. I love muzzle training for all dogs um, because they're useful for more than just reactive or aggressive behavior. They're used for dogs who have pika, who just want to eat everything, um, or dogs that like to pick up things on the walk. Or if your dog ever has a medical emergency and needs to be muzzled at the vet, they feel more comfortable wearing a muzzle and it can be a very calming thing for them rather than something that increases stress. So I really suggest you check out what's called the Muzzle Up Project, a fantastic website with tons of training videos, um, education about using muzzles, finding the right kind of muzzle and how to fit them correctly. You don't want to use one of the veterinary muzzles um, that keep the mouth more closed. You want to use a more basket style muzzle that allows your dog to take treats, to drink water, to pant, right? So you need to make sure that it, it gives them more freedom in the muzzle than at the vet, which are used for short term use only um, in those situations. So Gunther was muzzle trained as well. When we first started working, he would wear his muzzle. Um, for our safety. Um, and he loved it because that's when the string cheese came out. So, <laughs> so I highly recommend getting your dog used to being muzzled. It is a fun trick for them uh, when you do it right. And it's so useful in a variety of situations. I'm going to go back actually, because I don't want to distract myself. I do want to talk about a little about what tools I avoid. Um, I avoid any tool and training methodology that is what, what we call aversive. So something that adds pain or discomfort to a dog to make a behavior decrease. So I avoid shock collars, I avoid prong collars, I avoid choke collars, I avoid stem, e what, there's so many names, right? They're all collars that are causing discomfort, but really pain if they're working right. Um, when a dog does something, we use them to correct or they correct themselves. The reason I avoid these especially for reactive dogs or aggressive dogs, is almost always they're reacting because of a negative association or out of fear. The last thing I want to do is add to that association. So if they see a dog and they receive a correction from a prong or a shock, sure, it'll probably stop their barking, but they're making the association of, I see that dog and something hurts me. So dogs aren't good right? Dogs learn by association. And so we have to be very careful about what associations we're making for them. And we can't always know for sure what associations they're making, right? If we're using a bark shock collar and the dog barks and we're like, shush, and we shock them, they stop barking. But were they looking at the kid crossing the street? And now do they think that kids predict pain? We don't know. We don't want that to happen. So all of the unintended consequences and the fallout that happens from aversive tools can really increase your dog's reactivity and aggression, increase their fear and anxiety. And then there's tons of studies that show that the use of those kinds of tools actually increase aggressive, aggressive responses, um, both towards other stimuli, right? Dogs or people or things in their environment, but also redirecting that aggression to the owner. 
Um, and then what also happens is those tools actually train out any warning signals that we get before the bite happens. So do not use those with reactive dogs or aggressive dogs. You want to make sure that you're teaching them what to do instead, you're managing their environment, and you're working with a certified professional who has tons of other tools that are force-free and pain-free that will help your dog learn faster um, and make a really effective training plan and actually address the underlying cause of your dog's reactivity or aggression. Okay, I'm gonna be throwing around a lot of like terms <laughs> that in the training industry we use a lot, but I wanna make sure we all know what they mean um, before I dive into kind of what a training plan looks like. So a trigger, you'll hear me say trigger, the dog's trigger. A trigger is something that causes your dog to, over, to go over threshold or overreact, right? So this could be people, people in general, or certain kinds of people. Um, children is a big one that I've uh, worked with dogs with. Men in hats, I feel so bad for men in hats, <laughs> or men with beards is another one. Could be people just running. People walking normally might not trigger a dog to overreact, but runners might, right? Um, so the movement matters. Other dogs is probably the most common one that I work with in my area for reactivity, um, but could be other animals. And then moving objects, so passing cars or bicycles or skateboards or scooters. I saw like a, a electric unicycle the other day, you know, things like that can really trigger some overreactivity um, in dogs, especially breeds like herding breeds um, who are very movement focused. Um, so that's what a trigger is. It's the thing that causes your dog to react. Then you'll also hear me say a lot about threshold. Um, it is so important to know your dog's threshold if they're reactive. And I love this chart, this reactivity chart um, drawn by Lily Chin. She actually drew it for uh, what's called behavior adjustment training by Grisha Stewart in your resources. Um, she has a whole program for reactivity, one of the many protocols that trainers use. Um, I'll link to that book as well if you wanna dive deeper into that. Um, but I love this chart because it shows you kind of the levels of reactivity. And if you see there in the yellow line, it's like this invisible line threshold for reactivity. It's the distance at which a dog starts to react, goes over the edge and starts to go nuclear, right? But underneath th threshold, so under threshold, your dog is relaxed, right? They're able to learn under threshold. Their brain isn't gone, right? As they get closer to that threshold line, they start to get more alert, right? They notice it, their ears prick forward, they might close their mouth and they're like, I see the thing. Right? But it's still far enough away that I'm not overreacting yet. So I can still get that dog's attention with the right kind of things, treats, uh, practice on name recognition, practice on touch, some behaviors we've built up good foundations for. So they're still under threshold. It's when they go over that line, that that's what we call over threshold. The dog went over threshold. They aren't responsive at that point. They usually, the easiest way I can tell a dog is over threshold is they don't take treats. So they might not be barking and lunging yet, but they don't want the piece of chicken that's in front of their face, right? They're too worried about the other thing that's getting closer, right? Or it's been there a long time. <laughs> so they're, they're too focused. Another way I tell if a dog's over threshold, they might take a treat, but it's like they don't even know they're eating a treat. It might fall out the other side of their mouth or they take it with a really hard mouth um, and snap at my fingers. They're starting, they're just losing any control over their behaviors and their impulse control. I want to do all of my behavior work under threshold, right? So just under that invisible line, that distance, right, or intensity of the trigger, that's where your dog can still learn, right? If they're over threshold, it's not worth even trying at that point. We'll talk about what to do when a dog goes over threshold a little bit. Um, so as you can see in this chart too, kind of as I was talking about when aggression and reactivity overlap, it ends with aggressive behavior. There is a bite threshold. If they want something to go away and it keeps getting closer, right? And they can't escape, eventually they will react with biting because they're like, I've tried everything to make you leave me alone and you're not leaving me alone, so let's go, right? And that's when you get the fight or the bite um, as you go. Um, so that's the reactivity chart. Uh, the threshold mostly is distance is the easiest way to kind of manage the threshold 
level that your dog is at, adding distance, decreasing distance as you get better. Um, but triggers can also be intensity level, right? So kind of like the, the runners, people walking is fine, but if they're running, that's an intense movement, right? So that can be a trigger. Or the duration of trigger exposure um, is important for threshold as well. They might be fine with a dog at 10 feet away for 20, 30 seconds, but if it doesn't leave after that amount of time, they're getting more tense and then they, they react. Um, so you wanna make sure that they're staying under threshold when you're working on changing their behavior and tackling their reactivity. Um, if you go over thresholds, you're not gonna get much response. They're not learning as well as they, they can. Okay, useful foundation behaviors. So things you can start working on, and I will have resources for you to really dive deep into these in the follow-up email, because we just don't have time today to go over everything, uh, but leash walking skills. So if you do have a dog who pulls on leash, really focus on teaching them polite leash walking. Um, the U-turn, so an emergency U-turn, which is just changing direction really fast. Super useful, because if you have a reactive dog, and a dog appears around a corner, right? Or someone on a bicycle appears, you don't want your dog to react. And so you need to keep their focus and move, move away. And so having the emergency U-turn is really, really nice. Um, and you wanna practice that ahead of time because usually if we don't practice, you get a dog you're walking along, bike appears around the corner and they start going faster that way. And then you're trying to pull them the other way. And that pressure on them Pulling them back can increase their reactivity level because they're like, let me at them, right? And so you really want to work on a positive U-turn. Um, and then name recognition, right? So this is just the look at me cue, um, but I teach it as the dog's name, which means if you hear your name, you should look up at my face, right? And so that's a great way to break your dog's focus to prevent them from going over threshold and keeping them focused on you, right? So that they're not just staring and getting more and more tense. And I do have a video, um, I'll show you two videos for this one. Um, the first one's for U-turn and name recognition. This was with my dog, Suki. Share this here. And so I use, this is just me practicing in the neighborhood. I use um, her name to get her to look and then my U-turn cue is let's go. And so that means follow me where I'm going, right? And she's not in a tight heel here. She's just on a nice relaxed walk, but I wanna practice that in a variety of contexts, right? Where it's like, you're just enjoying yourself. And when you hear, let's go, you follow me this way and it's awesome, right? I'll play this here for you. Suki, let's go. Yes, good girl, what a good girl, very nice. Like, Where's my treat, huh? <laughs> So that one is very simple, but you do need to just practice. Um, start with low distraction, teaching them that they hear their name, they look at you, something good happens. And then practicing the U-turn um, on leash. Again, I'll include some resources that show you step-by-step -step for these things in your follow-up email. The next one I really like is touch. And I'll share a video of Gunther, who you saw a picture of, um, where she's using touch in one of our later um, reactivity sessions where he's doing fantastic. And actually my dog is the decoy dog. Um, and I had an assistant for this session so I could actually record some video. Um, where he's doing really well at about a distance of maybe 15, 20 feet, right? He's not reacting anymore. Um, it did take time to get here. So this again is a later session. Um, but she uses touch to redirect his focus. She sees him and you'll see here in the video, he looks at Suki, my dog, and he doesn't get tense, but his mom knows if he stares for too long, he might get tense and then start to react. So I'm gonna redirect him with me. It's gonna be fun and it'll keep him going where I want him to go. Um, so you'll hear her cue touch um, and then keep him moving right along. Because I'm a rock star. <laughs> Good. Let's go. Touch. Good. So in that video, I love how aware, how situationally aware his mom is. Um, because she knows if he stares too long, it's not going to be fun. Um, and she'd done so well getting there um, that she didn't want him to have a reactive experience and 
take her back in her training plan that she'd gotten to. So muzzle training, like I talked about, uh, really important, especially if you have a dog who is on that higher end of reactivity, um, a dog who cannot control um, their reaction and is starting to snarl, bite, um, especially dogs who might redirect to their owner. Um, we practice muzzle training before we even get out and about um, into our um, training setup sessions that we do. And then a foundation behavior for us humans is learning canine body language. And this is where working with a trainer can really help you out because they'll be able to walk you through what they see um, with your dog and what your dog is trying to tell you um, before they start barking or lunging or reacting. There are lots of things that we watch for, tenseness in the face, ear position, tail position. A wagging tail does not mean your dog is always happy. It depends on the kind of wag. So it takes some education and some studying to learn what different things mean. And that helps you better understand your dog and understand when you can intervene rather than just reacting to their overreaction. So this is kind of what a behavior plan looks like. Again, very general. This would be much more individualized for each dog that I work with. There's a whole packet that my clients get um, for reactivity training. But it always, always, always starts with a veterinary consult. Um, a lot of reactive behavior or aggressive behavior um, can be caused by pain. So I want to rule out underlying medical issues that could be contributing um, to their behavior. Um, medicine and behavior, it's all, it's all intertwined, both in us and our dogs. So we want to make sure that a dog is on the right track medically before we start addressing behavior on its own. And then I always increase enrichment and physical exercise. Um, so this was part of the preventing, but it's also part of the treatment plan. I want to make sure the dog has a, an outlet for their natural instincts to lower anxiety, right, um, and burn excess energy so that then they're in the right mind space to learn what to do instead of reacting. And then I identify the trigger. Uh, for some dogs, it might just be one thing, but for other dogs, it might be a few things, right? And so I have to know what can make this dog overreact so that then I can make sure that I am aware of those things in the environment and when I'm setting up training practice sessions that I'm, I'm really making sure I'm using the right kind of thing to help the dog learn what to do instead. Then I identify the threshold. I look to see what's the distance at which the dog can notice the trigger but not react, right? Is it distance or is it duration? Is it when the trigger is there for a long time or is it the intensity level of the trigger, right? So I need to define those things for that particular dog in order to set them up for success in training sessions. Um, and then also for regular things like going for a walk so that their owner knows, okay, this distance has been okay, right, in the past. So I'm going to make sure that that is my minimum, right, distance that I am away from the trigger um, as we go to set them up for success. And that leads into the environmental management. So teaching the owner, you need to take walks at always staying under threshold. You need to make sure there's enough distance between you and your dog's trigger um, to make sure that they're not having reactive episodes because every time they react, their brain is learning that behavior is what happens in that context and they will keep choosing it, right? Unless we manage their environment and then start implementing counter conditioning. Um, and this is where all that behavior change takes place um, for the dog. So that's what an overview of a behavior plan looks like. And we'll talk a little bit about this because I did get some questions um, sent in ahead of time kind of about like, what do I do for my dog when I'm on a walk? Um, and, and how do I manage the environment? And so I wanna make sure we know what to do to just set our dogs up for success. So knowing your dog's threshold is the number one. How far away can their trigger be where they see it, but they don't overreact, right? How close is too close, right? Set up your walks for success. So think about, okay, all the dogs are out in my neighborhood for their morning walks at like 8.30. Um, I'm gonna walk my dog at 6.30 right? So changing the time of your walk, changing the area you walk your dog, right? So if your neighborhood is just full of dogs um, in their yards behind a fence um, and your dog reacts to them every time, then maybe you hop in your car, drive a few blocks out, and then go for a walk in a quieter neighborhood, right? So finding places that you can walk your dog 
that they're less likely to react and you have a little bit more control over the environment and the, the threshold distance. Um, what's actually nice right now is during the pandemic, a lot of schools are closed. And so I know a lot of owners of reactive dogs have been taking advantage of walking their dog on the school grounds um, because they're less likely to encounter other dogs there, right? And so finding that, that safe place where you can enjoy a walk with your dog is really important and prevent any reactive moments. Also being sure that, you know, I want to make sure you guys know, you can advocate for your dog and you can be very, very you know, forthright about, do not let your dog greet my dog, right? If someone's like, oh, my dog's friendly, that's fine, but your dog is not, right? They're overwhelmed in that situation. And who cares if their dog is friendly? Your dog is your responsibility. And you want to make sure that they stay safe in under threshold. And so you can be very up, you know, just tell people, no, you cannot greet my dog. No, your dog cannot say hi to my dog. Can you please back up for a second while I move away? Um, so really telling people I need space. Um, one great way to do this is saying my dog is contagious. Um, or right now, I'm contagious. <laughs> Use that <laughs> as an excuse, right? Anything to make sure that your dog has that distance and stays under threshold. Um, there have been moments where I've had to be very forceful for clients um, in actually pushing people away from a dog um, because they're like, oh, I'm a dog person. It's fine. I'll show you what to do. Ignoring the owner's instructions um, and requests. And then I stepped in, which is always fun when a five foot tall woman steps in and shoves you back. Super fun. <laughs> but it was worth it for that dog's well-being and their behavioral progress as we went. The other option, this is going to sound really weird, um, is if you have a reactive dog, stop going for walks, right? You do not have to walk your dog if they're getting a lot of mental enrichment at home. You're doing physical exercise at home, inside fetch, or in a yard if you have one. You don't have to walk them, right? There are other ways to exercise your dog, and it is okay to not walk a dog that doesn't enjoy it that has an awful experience whenever they go out for walks. If you can provide other alternatives, um, puzzles at home. So work to eat toys are one of my favorite things, but sniff mats, right? Scattering treats throughout the grass, nose work games like that, finding yummy things with their nose. Um, lots of mental enrichment and then exercise at home, right? Training sessions are great mental enrichment as well. Um, so do not feel bad if you're like, I can't go on another walk with my dog. I'm so frustrated and it freaks them out. And it's just, we're all just mad when we get home. Don't walk your dog, right? You'll only be walking your dog then when you're working in conjunction with a trainer, right? In set up environments. So in environments where we can make sure the threshold is followed, right? And that we're making sure the dog isn't going over, like over their threshold line, that's when you're gonna start walking your dog again. But until then, you're preventing the reactive behavior from happening by just not walking the dog. And it's totally fine. So what do you do when your dog goes over threshold? This inevitably happens, right? Um, someone walks around the corner, right? A dog appears, they get out of their car suddenly, right? You weren't expecting them, you didn't see them in there. Um, it's going to happen no matter how much we try to manage the environment. Um, so when it does happen, I try to add distance whenever I can. Um, so some of my some of my sessions, it's been me like walking up random people's driveways, um, like onto their front porch. And I'm sure they were like, who is this person when they see me on their ring? But I'm adding distance away from whatever the trigger is that's passing by. Um, I also will use the environment to block the visual of the trigger, especially if there isn't distance that I can create, depending on where I'm at. Um, in the neighborhood. So walking behind a car, um, we're trying to get behind some garbage bins, something to block that visual of the reactive dog to their trigger. I look for that. And then you really do want to stay as calm as possible. Um, the more anxious that you get, the more tense you get, your dog will feel that through the leash, right? They are very in tune with our emotions. So if they're like, you're getting anxious, I'm getting anxious. What are we anxious about? And they're like, oh, a dog's there. And then they freak out. So you want to stay as calm as possible. Try to keep the leash loose, which is where leash walking skills come in handy. If you see a dog or their trigger approaching, don't, don't do that. That will cue your dog to be like, oh, something's here. I got, I got to react to it, right? 
And then if they do go over threshold, just wait it out, right? You can try to give treats, but it's kind of pointless if they're over threshold. Because again, they're not really going to want them or notice that they're happening. They're not learning anything. So I do kind of wait till the dog kind of goes, Whoo, right? And they might still be tense and panting and kind of over, over threshold a little bit, right? But then I might ask for a name recognition cue or touch something that tells me, okay, your brain's back. Focus back on me. Good job. Take a breath, right? And then usually, depending on the dog, I will head home. I will end the session or I'll end the walk um, because I don't want to do what's called trigger stacking, which is a dog appears. Okay, I'm, I'm just under threshold. And then the dog goes away. Okay. And then another dog appears. Now there's two triggers that stacked, right? And then they get a little bit higher on their reactivity scale. Oh, and then a bike appears, right? And so you're stacking all these different triggers on top of each other and the dog is getting more and more tense. So even if you've done some great counter conditioning training for reactivity, if there's lots of triggers happening, then they're gonna go over threshold at some point. And we don't wanna hit that point. So I'll usually head home um, if they're having trouble kind of settling back down again. Um, and I provide lots of calming activities once I do get home. Um, so chewing, licking and sniffing are naturally calming behaviors and um, instinctual behaviors in our dogs. So using, you know, appropriate chews for your dog when you get home, licking mats um, as you go or uh, snuffle mats to get them sniffing or scattering treats in the yard. Something that kind of focuses all that, that tension into a calming activity is really important. And that recovery time is really important to know for each dog. It's different for each dog. Uh, there was one uh, border collie who had three days that took to recover from one, um, one overreaction, right? It is all the chemicals and hormones in your dog's brain, all those stress chemicals just building up in their brain. And it takes time for the body to regulate those and bring them back to normal. Some dogs, they bounce back a lot faster. Right, so it just depends, and that's why I really want those calming activities to help them settle. If you have a dog with a very long recovery time, don't go for a walk until their recovery time has settled, right? Until they seem a little bit more more chill. So I do want to show you kind of some recovery time. This is again um, a later session with this dog. Make sure I get the right one. Her name is Katie, and. She's, uh, she's reactive to both children um, and other dogs. Uh, not too high on the severity level. Like she was a quick learner, um, also because her owners were very consistent um, and did a lot of training setups um, to work on those specific triggers. But here you'll see there is some trigger stacking happening. happening. Um, where we're at, there's a lot of people walking by on the waterfront, there's other dogs, there's kids around, and so there's a lot of things going on. And you'll see, she does start to go over threshold, she does bark when she sees another dog, but then her dad does a great job of redirecting her focus, keeping her focused on him, and you'll see kind of how her recovery time gets really quick towards the end. So she's able to focus and sit and kind of settle. Good. Lots of U-turn. <laughs> Good. Good. Good redirecting her. Good. Now keep her focus here. Good. Good. <laughs> Thank you, though. <laughs> That's a boy. Keep, keep, keep. Good. Good. You see the arousal level change, right? Yeah. Be partly trigger stack. That was good though. Nice. And she settles again pretty quickly, which is nice to see too. So very kind of hyper dog, high energy dog. She's pretty young there. She's about, a, I think she was just over a year old um, when we started working with her. Um, but she barks and then he redirects her and she's like, okay, I'm still aware of the dogs there, but I'm going to focus on you, right? And so you see her kind of bounce with that recovery time as, as she goes. So behavior change is all about counter conditioning. You're changing your dog's emotions about their trigger. 
Uh, we do this with what's called classical conditioning. Classical conditioning, Pavlov, <laughs> does Pavlov ring a bell? Um, that is all about the presence of the trigger means good things happen to you. Treats rain from the sky when your trigger is around. It has nothing to do with what your dog is doing in that moment, right? It's important though to stay under threshold so your dog can make that association and you can start to see that emotional response change from a negative one to a positive emotional response of, oh, dog, chicken happens, right? We want to change that emotion. And I mean, dogs love, most dogs love chicken. So you also want to teach your dog what to do instead of reacting. This is called operant conditioning. So it, this is where we teach them your behavior can make the treat happen when your trigger is around. Um, so using look at me, that name recognition, using U-turns like he was doing with Katie, sit stays. He also was doing that touch like with Gunther in his video, teaching them what to do instead, which also helps break their focus as you kind of work to manage the environment as needed, right? And over time, what we see if we do this correctly is we see that threshold decrease in distance, right? And so a dog is able to walk closer by people or other dogs or cars can pass without them freaking out. We start to see them get less reactive as the trigger intensifies. Um, you do wanna make sure when you're working on classical conditioning that the order is correct. And we'll talk about that in a few slides in I think the next slide, but I wanna show you some videos first. Um, this is going to be Katie again, um, practicing her U-turns, keeping her engaged um, with her owner. And what I want you to notice here in this video, make sure I can see the video too, there we go. Um, there is a muzzle that we muzzle trained her on and then squeeze cheese to give her in the muzzle. Um, if you are muzzle training, finding a treat that is easy to give through a muzzle, super nice, right? So squeeze cheese makes it easy to squeeze through little openings, um, string cheese or turkey hot dog sliced really thin um, or, you know, whatever it is that you find that works, a spoon with peanut butter smeared on the end to make treating in a muzzle easier. Um, but she again is at towards the end of her behavior plan. Um, so we didn't feel like she needed it, but it's there if we felt like we did. Um, so this is her practicing around children. Um, and you can see what he does is he gets closer and then he backs away again. He'll get closer to the children playing on the playground and then backs away again, right? So relieving some of the pressure she might be feeling if she starts to get worried about children. There. So hey, oh you notice the kid, I'm gonna turn and walk away. And then nice. Nice U turn. Oh, almost got it. The stroller in the distance, so he's back. Good. Happy girl. So, over time, we do want to work to where a dog can be closer to their trigger, um, calmer around their trigger. That's the goal um, as we do this. But in some cases, I do have to talk to owners about their expectations for their reactive dog, and that some dogs, it's just not going to be where, yeah, you can, you know, greet another dog on leash with your dog. You know, it's not a, it's not a good expectation to have. But how about we set the goal at we can walk calmly by that dog on the same side of the sidewalk, right? And so we really have to think about what is a goal that's attainable for our dogs and what are we okay with? Um, and then accepting where we get to a point where our dog's doing great, but if we keep pushing them too far, right? If we keep pushing them closer, it's really just gonna take us a lot further back in our training plan and we don't wanna do that. Um, we wanna make sure our dogs stay um, happy and stress-free. Okay, so what you can start doing now, you can start doing this right away, uh, start managing your dog's environment. So if walking, going on walks is just awful every time and they're reacting every time they see another dog or a person, whatever their trigger is, consider not going on walks, 
right? Consider doing other things throughout their day to burn some energy, get that mental enrichment in, right? Start to think about what your dog's threshold is and then making sure you're always staying under threshold um, with the distance from their trigger. And then start practicing classical conditioning when your dog is under threshold, right? So if you are still able to go on walks and you're able to manage the distance from the trigger, start practicing classical conditioning, which is the trigger appears and then the treat happens, right? This timing is super important. If the treat happens before their trigger, they might be learning treats predict a dog about to walk around the corner and the treats then lose their power they start to have a different kind of meaning for your dog, right? And that's not treating that reactivity that we really want to focus on. So you need to make sure your dog notices their trigger and then the treat happens, right? And make sure to manage that distance. Make sure to manage that threshold level because if they go over threshold, you will regress in your training, right? And then you have to let them go through their recovery time. And then if you do go out and decide, okay, my dog's reactive, but there's this awesome park near my house where I can sit down with my dog on leash and then 50 feet away, there's people walking by, right? Set up a training session where you're just going to stay there. And anytime a dog walks by or a bike, whatever it might be that your dog reacts to, your dog notices, yes, here's a treat. Yes, here's a treat, right? So you're setting up a training session, but keep those short and sweet. You don't want to do too much for your dog too fast. And then you really do need to connect with a certified trainer um, because they're going to be the ones that can help you learn canine body language, take that classical conditioning even further, help you with training setups where you're going to start uh, changing the threshold distance and working towards more, you know, better expectations for your dog's walks. And then also working with a trainer, there's so many kind of subsets of reactivity training we love acronyms in the training industry. So there's BAT, uh, B-A-T, uh, by Grisha Stewart. There's also CAT, C-A-T. There's LAT, which is look at, look at that training. Um, there's lots of different things with just slight adjustments in the protocol. And so a, a certified trainer is going to really help, you know, personalize the plan for your dog, see what works best, right? Help you understand their body language. This really is something that you shouldn't have to go alone. Um, in trying to treat. Um, and so there are lots of us out here who want to help owners of reactive dogs to make your life easier and then to help your dog feel better um, about their triggers. And then one thing to remember too is that progress is not always linear. You're, you're going to have times where your dog goes over threshold because we might not have noticed a dog was walking on the other side of the street or they appear out of nowhere. Um, so don't give up, right? Things like that are going to happen. We just start from where we can and then build from there. Um, so you really just want to stick with it, stay consistent. And again, having a professional on your side as part of your support team goes a long way because um, we're, we'll also be your therapist in those moments too, um, to help you get through it and then start, start again um, from where you're at. Okay. Oh, love PowerPoint. <laughs> okay. So I have not been looking at chat. Um, see where we're at and then we'll kind of go through if there's any questions there but we also have all the questions that came in ahead of time um, that we want to go through so Mia if Mia is on here I'm here and it doesn't look like there are any questions in the chat so um, if you'd like we can move along to the questions that were uh, written in and hopefully my my pug won't be uh, making too much noise as I read them. Little <laughs> things to say, <laughs> always. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, so our first question is from Jill, who says that she has an eight-month-old mm -hmm. mixed breed um, who's 50 pounds. She's always been wary of scooters and trucks but she's recently begun barking at people on the sidewalk, especially people in lots of winter gear and children. Um, we all wear masks and coats and I have a seven-year-old, so I'm not sure what's bothering her, but I'd like to address this before it becomes an issue. She doesn't lunge at other uh, dogs. She just lays down and refuses to move until they pass. <laughs> she wants to meet them all. Yeah, okay. Could be a couple of different things. Um, there is what's called a fear period, and there's a couple of them as a puppy matures. 
in through adolescence and into adulthood. Um, so things that they might not have reacted to before during their fear period, they might all of a sudden begin reacting to um, or showing some fear. Um, so that could be part of why it's happening. Um, it could also just be the change in the outline of the people approaching in the winter clothes. Even if you wear coats and jackets and, and winter gear, um, your dog knows it's you. Um, smell. They know it, it's you because it smells like you. And that's different than a stranger that they aren't familiar with who looks different in the distance, right? That outline is really important for dogs um, as well. So those could be some of the things contributing to it. Um, what's interesting is that the dog's laying down and doesn't want to move. So it, that can be more on that fearful reactivity where I don't, I, I want to hide. I want to kind of run away. I'm just going to stay here. Look, I'm no threat right? You don't want it to escalate to where the dog's like, okay, now you're so close that I feel like I need to defend myself and get you out of my space and then start to bark and lunge. So I would do a lot of classical conditioning, right? Where as long as she isn't reacting, so she's not starting to kind of balk at the, at the appearance of her trigger, where someone, you know, a child and, and their parent in winter gear are walking towards them, she sees them, yes, there's some treats, right? Maybe even scatter treats to try to give her some space away from the approaching people. So if there's um, room on the side of the sidewalk, something like that to add some distance, right? But still teaching her that treats rain from the sky when that thing is around, right? Um, also starting to teach her kind of an appropriate behavior like touch or let's go. So follow me so you don't just plop down and sit here, right? Follow me to a further distance where you're more comfortable, right? Instead of, of that fearful reactive behavior in a way. So it is the same, it's the same protocol, but it's just, you have to tweak it for each dog. You have to figure out what's the threshold for the dog, what's the highest value treat you can use to keep her focus on you, and then building the foundational behaviors for the operant conditioning of, oh, I see a, a kid in a big winter jacket. I look at mom, here's chicken, right? And then I'm able to, have a great emotional response when I see a kid walking by in their winter gear and, oh, hi, mom, right? Where's my chicken, right? We want to get to the point where they are trying to make their reward happen when they see their trigger. That's a good emotional response that I want to build there. So same thing, classical conditioning, operant conditioning, managing the distance as much as you can. So moving away to keep her under threshold so you can work on it as you go. All right, um, and we just actually got a, uh, a comment in the comments area um, from Dawn, uh, who said, we switched to a halty a few weeks ago after an incident where she dragged me across a sidewalk. Um, I hope you're okay, Dawn. Uh, she's fairly used to the halty now, but still rubs my legs periodically when we're walking. So um, once she corrects her location, I give her a treat. I sometimes wonder if she's rubbing my legs to get a treat. Yeah. Dog, some dogs are very smart in that they, they learn a behavior chain of like, hmm, what am I getting this treat for? Was it rubbing, rubbing my face on your leg and then a treat happens, right? So again, the associations we think they're building might not be the associations that they have, right? Um, so just keep up the, the desensitization work with, with the Halty. Um, love that she's getting more and more comfortable with it. But even if you just kind of do some more desensitization practice at home um, to just help her get more comfortable wearing it, um, even just practicing some leash, like silky leash um, pressure. This is a game where we just teach a dog give in to leash pressure. So it's not a pop or a jerk. It's just like, oh, you feel a little bit of directional pressure. This way, follow it, right? Get used to that feel of being directed by your head rather than collar or harness just kind of working really short and sweet um, sessions there to just continue to build that. And it might be something that she's just like, there's this thing on my face and it kind of itches. So, you know, it's hard for us not to scratch our nose when our nose itches. So if she's like, Oh, this thing, this thing's tickling my face. She might just need to, to rub her head on your leg to just kind of reset it. Um, you could wait a little bit longer before giving the treat. So she kind of corrects her position to where you want her. You take a few more steps before you go. Yes, here is the treat. Right. And so that way it's, there's more, there's more space between the thing you, she might think she's getting the treat for versus what she's really getting the treat for there uh, as you go. Good question though. <laughs> Excuse me. 
Um, and April just uh, wrote in asking, I know each dog is unique, but how long can it take to achieve desired results? Great question. Depends on the results you're wanting. Uh, depends on the severity level of your dog's reactivity. It depends on the reason why your dog is reacting, um, whether it's fear-based, if it's anxiety-based, is that anxiety generalized anxiety? So is it something that we need to treat with prescription medication in conjunction with your veterinarian or your veterinary behaviorist, right? So there's so many contributing factors. I cannot tell you how long your dog will take. Um, but that's why working with a professional, because <laughs> We love data. And so we're tracking our progress as we go. And then if we don't see the progress we expected to see based on what we've, you know, like watched your dog doing in their body language and their response levels, if we don't see that progression like we want. We will tweak something. We will look to be like, okay, this isn't working. Let's try this. Right. So that's where having that support um, behind you. Um, rather than going it alone, is going to help make your training uh, more effective and faster. Um, and then reinforcing for you too, because then you'll be like, oh, that is progress. Because sometimes too, when we're working on something alone, we're like, this still really sucks, right? But then if I haven't seen a client in two, three weeks between sessions, and then I see them after that three weeks, I'm like, you've been working on that, and that's great. They're 10 feet closer to that dog and not reacting. And they're like, oh, I didn't even realize. Right. And so having someone else's perspective really helps us, you know, feel more successful and notice the progression as we go. Um, so it really is dependent on the dog. I wish I could give you an answer. Um, but in my experience, I've had clients where, you know, about a month of work, you know, their dog was a lot better. Um, but those were the more mild cases. And then in the more severe cases, I worked with Gunther for about eight, nine months before she felt comfortable continuing work on her own. Um, with just doing some random check-ins um, over email and stuff. So, so, yeah. Sorry, I can't give you a better answer. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to go back to the written in questions, and then we've got another one um, that just came in through the chat. So this question comes in from Diane, who says, any tips for old ladies using a walker and walking another dog um, that's uh, one is no problem, I guess. Um, the problem is okay um, until the other dog gets close to us. Okay. Yeah. So I actually chatted with Diane back and forth about this because uh, my first suggestion was leave the problem dog at home, right? Do they need a walk? Can you give them some great enrichment and exercise at home? Awesome. While you do that, you can still walk your other dog. Um, as you go while you find a trainer to set up training sessions, right? The other option was leave the okay dog at home and start working on some classical conditioning, some operant conditioning, start working on behavior change um, with the problem dog. Because if you have one dog who's reacting and one dog who's okay, you have no hands in order to like treat one and the other and your attention is split and it's really hard, right? And so you never want to work on a reactive dog with another dog with you. Right, that's impossible to get anything done effectively. Uh, the problem with Diane's situation is that the okay dog is her, her service dog. So she cannot leave the okay dog at home while she works on the reactive behavior. So that's really where I was like, you know, that the problem dog, the reactive dog needs to not be put in the situations where he becomes reactive. So pause your walks, right? connect with a professional who can set up a training plan and then create some great training decoy sessions where they have another dog with them and you work on creating better associations and, and changing the distance, as well as learning how to do some U-turns that are gonna be different based on what you have with you on your walk, right? And so really building up the foundational behaviors you need and then really controlling the environments where you're working on the reactivity. Um, so that one was a tough one. Um, and it can be tough too uh, when other people keep approaching with a dog and you know that your dog's about to just lose it. That's where advocating for your dog can come in handy. Um, so work those old lady skills and be like, hey, can you please cross the street, right? Um, things like that where you're trying to control that or if possible kind of moving behind a visual block like a car or up, um, up the sidewalk, up a, a driveway, something like that to add distance. But in her situation, I think just not walking the reactive dog outside of training setups is going to be the best. 
All right, so we've got um, a question from um, Kigo or Kaigo. I'm sorry if I, uh, I obviously mispronounced your name one of the ways at least. Um, so apologies for that. Um, they say this isn't necessarily related to leash walking, uh, but we have an eight month old 30 pound mixed breed puppy. And they also walk a neighbor's older dog who's 10 years old and about the same size. And when they walk them together, Cello, love that name, um, their puppy kind of nips at the older dog and snips at her ears. The older dog ignores Cello most of the time and occasionally she'll snap back, but otherwise we have to pull him out of the other dog's way. How should we handle this? When we take him to the dog park, he's more calm and hovers near us and he's never done that to another dog at the park. He's also more docile on his walks. Uh, the older dog is the only one he does that to. Yeah. Um, it could be that he's comfortable with that older dog and so is doing more play behavior, nipping at that and trying to get him engaged or rile him up knowing adolescent dogs. So pestering a little bit. Um, depending on the body language, without seeing it, I can't really tell you what his intent might be um, of why he's, you know, snipping out her ears and things like that. Sounds like my puppy with my senior dog. She's like, I'm going to eat your ears all the time. Um, but what I would do is I would add some distance on your walk. So I want to think about what do I want the puppy to do instead right? Which is just walk more calmly by, by your, your doggy friend, right? So I add distance between the dogs. I do what we call parallel walks, um, where you're further apart width wise. So like sidewalk, sidewalk, or depending where you're walking, right? You add some distance so the dog can't get to the other dog to nip and snip at the ears. And then I'm going to teach them alternative and incompatible behaviors. So when we're getting a little closer to the dog, look at me. Yes, here's a treat, right? So rewarding the behaviors you want. And then if the dog gets overstimulated, it's like, oh, ears, right? And goes for it. No, we're going to walk further away. You're not ready for that kind of closeness yet, right? And so really just managing that environment and then teaching an alternative behavior and reinforcing that, reinforcing that. Adolescent dogs, I mean, teenagers, teenagers, am I right? Um, they have a lot of energy. They have a lot of hormones flying around. And so they're just like bouncing off the walls. And so sometimes it just takes some maturity and some growth to settle. And we don't want them to learn habits that are inappropriate, like biting at the other dog's ears and practice it over and over again while we kind of wait till they mature. We wanna make sure we're at least trying to reinforce what we want instead and building them up to closer walks together. But really manage the distance as you go. Um, you can also do walks, parallel walks, but they're like one dog ahead and then one dog behind and then switching them back and forth kind of this way. This is what I do with reactivity training is as we start to decrease the threshold and help the dog feel better closer to their trigger, we start parallel walking, right? We're farther apart. And then, you know, as we walk, we get closer and then we relieve the pressure. We go a little farther apart. One dog's ahead and then we get a little closer and then further and then we switch, right? So managing distance, even if it's not reactive behavior, it's just uh, teenage behavior can go a long way in preventing it. From happening. Good question. Um, before you hop to the next question, I did have a private chat message um, question, so I want to make sure that's not lost um, in my chat. From Amy, great questions. Um, is your barking class designed for puppies only? No, puppies of all ages are welcome in barking, uh, the All About Barking Puppy Essentials Workshop. Um, so yes, any age dog, we talk about all the different kinds of barking. Um, so figuring out why your dog is barking really determines what you do and how you train it. A lot of the behaviors are the same, but the setup might be different for depending on why. Uh, we do talk a little bit about leash reactivity in that workshop as well. Um, so great question. All dogs are welcome. Um, Amy was actually also wondering um, if the martingale is one of the collars that you don't recommend. I do not um, because, okay, this is a hard one, because I, I will use them for certain breeds of dogs such as greyhounds, um, because their head is like thinner than their, it's like the same size as their neck. So if I need a collar that doesn't, they can't back out of, a martingale is the one. But that's not a collar that I'm gonna be attaching a leash to when I'm working on reactivity. Um, that would be more of kind of just like a regular walking collar. Um, so if you have a reactive dog and you're using a martingale, if they pull or react, there's still pressure happening on their neck. And unfortunately, they are hard to size for the regular pet owner. 
um, they're not supposed to be tightened to where the dog feels that pressure. It's really, they were meant to prevent escaping and backing out of a collar. So I don't wanna add any of that aversive pressure that a dog could then associate with seeing another dog or whatever their trigger is. Um, also, I just don't like pressure on the neck um, because of tracheal damage, all the things. I mean, I, I've talked to veterinarians who've just seen so many awful um, injuries happen. Uh, you know, cervical, all this just, you know, I don't wanna, I don't wanna do that. Um, so harnesses are the ones that I always go for and correctly fitted harnesses. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the T-shaped harnesses are great. They're not restricting shoulder movement. Um, some of the harnesses, the one I showed you earlier is a Wonder Walker, and this actually I don't use anymore because it was um, going across my corgi shoulders. Um, and it's hard to keep it above uh, their collarbone where it's not restricting movement. So I don't wanna cause any issues um, in their musculoskeletal system. Um, so that's why finding the right tools is so important. So it's a great question because a lot of people will rely on martingales because it makes them feel more in control um, and that their dog can't escape. But you gotta find harness instead. And if you're worried your dog is gonna escape a harness, <laughs> my last dog, he figured it out like one wear. He was like, whoop, and it came out. I'm like, great, that's fantastic. I will do um, safety clasps. So like with Gunther um, earlier in the in the uh, yappy hour, he had his front attachment harness and a halty. If he ever slipped his halty, we still had him by the harness. If he ever slipped a harness, it'd be hard for him because he's so big. We still had him by the halty. Those things were connected, right? Because she had a double-ended leash. If I only have one leash, I will use a carabiner um, and kind of connect the two. Um, so front attachment harness, and then I find um, they make these now for trainers where there's a carabiner and a strap, and so you connect, and the dog still has lots of room between a head halter or their regular collar, if you're not using a head halter, and the harness, so they can still move freely. But if they slip one or the other, we still have them by one point of contact, um, even using just one leash. So again, safety and the, the tools you use really determine how safe you're being, um, both for a dog escaping um, or for you being pulled down um, by your dog. Got a big one. So good question. Good, good, good question. All right. Uh, next question is from Elaine. Uh, my puppy Molly returned from space surgery, seemingly traumatized from something. Um, that was three weeks ago. Uh, that night, she bared her teeth and bit me hard, unlike any behavior I've ever experienced from her. Um, poor Molly. Uh, poor Elaine, too. Um, since then, she is skittish and barks continuously at anyone or other dogs nearby. I've tried to give her extra love while I'm being firm that aggressive behavior is not allowed. So definitely something that I'd want uh, Elaine to discuss with her vet. Um, it is not uncommon to see behavioral changes after surgeries because, you know, they're under anesthesia. If you've ever been under anesthesia, it's weird, <laughs> right? You feel weird. Um, and then any post-op medications as well. Those all affect behavior. It's all chemicals in the brain, right? And so it, it's not uncommon to see changes in behavior. Um, what worries me is that the being firm that aggressive behavior isn't allowed, when a dog already feels unsure and all wonky and off, can create the wrong associations um, for the dog. So we wanna make sure that we're managing the environment, that we think about, you know, why did she bite me in that moment? Did she not realize it was me, right? Was she, <laughs> she a little high? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, you got to, you know, talk to your veterinarian to see what are the kinds of behavior changes that you've heard about with this medication? What should I do? Like, is there anything I should change medication wise? You really want to talk to your vet um, before just going to, you know, any kind of firm responses to aggression. Uh, instead, you want to make sure the dog feels comfortable and safe and then start to slowly teach them, I'm here, I'm not going to just reach out and pet you on the face, right? Um, or maybe if I was petting your abdomen, maybe that hurt because you just got spayed, right? There's a lot of medical stuff. And so that's why the veterinarian needs to be her first um, go-to to really discuss what to do. But you gotta make sure that you're not creating bad associations with any handling or kind of approaches and things like that that could stick around longer and then you have a, a unwanted behavior long-term. Um, so. Talk to your vet. They will get you started in the right direction. And then they can also um, tell you if you need to start working with a consultant and trainer um, as well. 
Um, we just got a comment or a question from Haley in the comments section. Um, my nine month old Chihuahua puppy has had surgery on her leg and the walks have been restricted to 10 uh, minutes, four times a day, increasing in five minute increments fortnightly. Um, she just wants to go off lead in um, the garden and go to the toilet, uh, barking at things behind the fence. Um, and is training still possible during, oh, this is a great question, is training still possible during recovery? Uh, she's going mental during this time. I'm sure she is. Yes. Yeah, I bet. Um, also, I'm going to start using the term fortnightly. I think that's the best. Um, so yes, you can definitely practice training, um, but you need to have her on leash while she's in, in, the, in the garden in the yard. Um, so because you don't want her running up to the fence and barking at those things. So this is the threshold where that distance threshold comes into play, um, where you need to stay at a far enough distance where she notices the trigger, but isn't reacting yet, and then classically conditioning it. That thing is awesome, right? And then you can also add in things of like, you see that, now look, look at me, and then rewarding that, that operant conditioning. And then as you work, you can start to get a little closer, but since she's on a leash, you have more control over um, that environment and managing the threshold. One thing that might help though, to help her feel like she has a little bit more freedom is using a long lead. Um, so a longer leash. Um, with a Chihuahua puppy, you wanna find one that's very lightweight. <laughs> so you can't like use the thick ones and never drag this huge leash around, but they do make really thin ones and you can get like a 10 foot, uh, depending on how big your garden is, but that does give her some freedom. And then as long as you're being situationally aware, if you're like, here's someone approaching, you know, and then you have kind of time to reel her in a little bit or call her to you, but you have, you know, a connection to her to help manage the threshold, but she can still run around without you chasing her around on leash too. Um, so kind of play around with that is what I would do. But yeah, still possible during recovery. You're just building on all those positive associations. Um, again, medication can affect training and behavior. So don't be surprised if there's a little regression after she's back to normal off medication if she's on it. Um, just kind of stick with it. Stay consistent. <laughs> yeah. And being like post-op recovery, trying to burn energy is hard. Um, so lots of mental enrichment inside is great. Scattering treats in the grass. Um, is really good to work in her nose. Um, so that would be good too, in the garden. <laughs> Little chihuahuas. Oh, that reminds me, I did have someone write in about, um, I'm skipping ahead, Mia, sorry. No, uh, there was a question. The, was it from Haley? Because I just saw her question was after the, <laughs> her actual question that she wrote in was after, was the next one up, so. Right, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, question from Haley was, I found a lot of techniques suit bigger dogs, even small dogs, but we have a really petite chihuahua that's really taken a dislike to other dogs during lockdown and struggling to get reasonable advice. Um, so yes, having a tiny toy breed dog is a, a lot different than working with a medium or even a large breed. Um, we talked about kind of like tools for larger breed dogs, smaller breeds, same behavior modification, same thing with classical conditioning, same thing with operant conditioning, same managing the environment. But for some small breeds, I will use a back attachment harness uh, because a front attachment is just always under their legs and it's hard to control the leash. So sometimes I'll use back, back attachment. One thing to think about too is how small the dog is. And so I have had clients, I've been like, okay, let's get down on the ground and look at the world from your dog's point of view. It is much different, right? And things that we might not think are that scary or intimidating, when you're this big, they're kind of scary and intimidating, right? And so it's, it's interesting to see people go, oh yeah, that would freak me out, right? These feet walking right next to me, right? Or that dog is way bigger than it looks to me when I'm standing up. Um, and so kind of making sure we understand how that affects threshold distance right? Um, and making sure that we're not teaching our dog to become more reactive. So it tends to be a habit of small breed owners to pick their dog up um, when their dog is reacting. That's fine if you need to remove them from the situation, right? If you're like, there's no way I can get far away from that dog approaching on the sidewalk, so I'm going to pick up my dog and turn and try to block the visual. Right, rather than leaving the dog on the ground where they can, you know, snap and bite at the dog passing by. So 
I don't want to do that if the dog is far away and the chihuahua goes, oh, I see a dog. And then we swoop them up and they go, why are you stressed? I should be stressed. And now I'm up here and I'm safer and I'm going to bark. Right. So a little different kind of responses we have, depending on the size of dog we have. Um, but it is about finding the correct threshold for the smaller dogs using the right tools. Um, so back attachment harness, it's a little easier uh, for us to use. Um, and then same thing, classical conditioning. One thing I do like for small breed dogs is it's hard for us to bend down and give a treat every time. So I have used like a spoon dipped in um, peanut butter um, or like my dog's wet food. I've been doing that a lot. <laughs> um, oh, I can even show you another one. But uh, so like a long wooden spoon with a yummy treat spread on the bottom and you can just lower it down to the dog for each successful repetition that helps your back. Um, I've been using this a lot with my puppy. This is just a travel shampoo bottle, like a little silicone one that I can put in the dishwasher. And I fill it with his, norm his normal wet food that's now on the computer. Um, and I squeeze it out whenever I want him to have a little bit. So it's an easy way to provide wet food as treats, um, but then also a little easier to go further down. He's a corgi, so I'm, I get tired all the time. So this is a little easier to just drop down and let them lick. Um, so that's really helpful for small dogs too, because treating can be tough on our human bodies. Yeah. But yeah, otherwise it seems tough. All right. Um, sorry, you might be hearing Mabel eating in the background. Um, all right, from Sue, uh, I've been to a behaviorist and have a behavior modification plan. My dog is reactive to other dogs and territorial. He's anxious 24 seven. Uh, we're working at a distance with another dog with a trainer. This week he got close to about um, 10 meters. Um, it's not consistent each week and we can only block him from other dogs, but there's always that one that we don't see. Um, he was attacked at puppy school uh, and then later at adolescent school. Medication was increased too high by a vet behaviorist and then he could not take any. Um, have tried natural medicine, no effect. He's good um, with people visiting the house. Um, and they have strategies in place, uh, but not doesn't like them standing up. So a lot of like to say goodbye, I guess. <laughs> a lot of different things going on in that dog's brain. Um, so what's so encouraging is to hear that they've already connected with a vet behaviorist and a trainer who has a plan. Um, and like I mentioned, you know, it's not always linear the progress that we want to see. Some, you know, we we're making progress, and then something happens, and it takes it back, right? We just got to keep going with that. You're going to get there. You might kind of bounce back every once in a while, but you're you're starting further than when you first started. Um, so staying consistent with it and then really talking to your, your veterinary behaviorist, talking to your trainer about your expectations, about the right treatment, trying out new things, following their advice about dosages, you know, all the different things that you've tried. Um, there's so many different things that are going on in the dog's brain that we're just trying to to tweak to find the best thing for that dog um, as we go. Also, it sounds like there's a lot of anxiety going around all going on all around. So not just reactivity on leash, but when people stand up, um, visitors to the house. So making sure that your trainer one knows about it, which I'm assuming they do, um, but then also starting to counter condition that, right? Where you're starting to teach the dog, sorry, um, that if someone starts to stand up, something good happens to you. And then they sit down. I actually did this with um, a client. I think she was here earlier. She's not here anymore. Um, but yeah, Nora, <laughs> if you're here, hi. Um, but where I would sit in a chair, uh, we were out on her patio and I'd start to stand up and then something good happened to her dog, Rory, right? Start to stand up, sit right back down, something good happened. So we're desensitizing the dog to people stand up, not a big deal, right? People can stand up. You don't need to react to that. So really teaching the dog a better emotional response and then also teaching the dog what to do instead um, when people stand up um, and then managing the environment, which it sounds like she, she said they have some management strategies in place, making sure that that dog can't have an aggressive um, reaction, making sure everyone's staying safe, um, keeping the dog out of the room when people are around just to prevent someone who doesn't realize when I stand up, this dog's going to freak out, right? Um, so 
sticking with it is really important. It's communicating with your veterinarian, the behaviorist, and then your trainer to make sure that you're all on the same page and that you're all on the same plan um, so that you can feel successful. Um, but consistency is key. It just depends on the dog how long it takes. Sorry, I just got spooky, but Mabel had to go outside. <laughs> um, all right, a uh, question from Serena. I have a golden retriever puppy who is five months of age and I really need help walking with him. He sometimes refuses to walk at all, occasionally rolling on the floor to convey his disapproval. He pulls when he sees other people and gets really overexcited when he meets other dogs, um, leaping and jumping around them, um, so much so that even confident dogs tend to walk away from him. He's also heavy and strong, and I fear for his safety and sometimes for my safety. What should I do? Yes, sounds like a five-month-old golden. <laughs> um, so yeah, so refusing to walk could be a couple things. At that age, that's one of the times when I don't really want to make them walk if they're not up for it. I don't want to overdo it. Um, and create negative associations of like dragging them on a walk, but really practicing really short and sweet training sessions at a low distraction area. So putting the leash on, you know, in the house or in your home and just taking a few steps and yeah, it was awesome, right? Here's an awesome treat or a little bit of your wet food. And then taking the harness and the leash off and starting to teach let's go, right? Follow me this way. So that it's the dog's like, oh, I like that, right? That always, you know, is fun and rewarding. Um, but again, maturity might help with that. Also making sure that whatever you're walking him with tool-wise, um, he isn't finding really uncomfortable and that's why he's laying down and refusing to walk. Um, some harnesses I do have to help a dog uh, get used to wearing or having it put over their head or just the feel of wearing it, very similar to desensitizing head collars. And so that might just take some practice and working with him to get comfortable. Um, the greet, <laughs> greeting other dogs, um, good for the other dogs for not just really correcting him uh, if they're overwhelming them, if he's overwhelming them, because uh, that's usually what you'd expect is a dog to be like, stop it, right? So good choices to just for them to walk away. That's great. Um, but teaching calm greetings does take some setups um, and then consistency. So again, thinking about what do I want my dog to do instead? Is it if you want to greet them, you can't pull, you can't lunge, you can't bark, you have to walk calmly next to me. You have to give me, you know, a look at me cue, maybe a touch. You have to sit when we get closer. So kind of self-control exercises. And as long as you're successful with those, you do get what you want, right? Because in that situation, treats aren't really what the dog wants. The dog wants to interact with that thing, with that person or that dog, right? So that's the main reinforcer that I'm using when I'm training it. Treats are nice to kind of help focus the dog and teach them that, okay, this is nice and we'll get to do the greeting. But if you pull and you lunge and you bark, you get overexcited, I'm going to use negative punishment. If you lose the thing you want, we get further away from that dog or that person until you can just whew, take a breath and control your behavior a little bit more. Right. So just practicing those self-control, working somewhere that's not as distracting first um, and then doing some setups like with friends or family, if possible, um, if someone has a dog um, that you that'll just kind of hang out <laughs> for you while you work on approaching and then retreating as needed. Um, just practicing those things, building a foundation um, will be really good for that puppy. All right. Mabel's decided she just wants to hang out outside. <laughs> Great. Love it. How spooky of you. It is October. Yeah, I'm wearing my uh, Golden Ghouls shirt. You probably can't see it, but... Um, It'd be cool if it glowed in the dark. <laughs> it would be cool. Uh, so Sebastian would like to know, um, how do I behave when my dog did something wrong and comes apologizing in a submissive manner? Um, I would look at why is the dog acting so submissive? Is it in a reaction to your reaction to the thing that happened. Um, because that will tell you a lot about what associations the dog is making with you, less about them <laughs> realizing what the, the correction or what they're in trouble for. Um, any correction needs to happen very quickly after the thing happens that we don't want anymore. And it needs to be effective. 
you usually see that submissive behavior when a dog doesn't quite know, like they're basically saying, you seem really angry and I'm trying to appease you. I'm trying to make you calm down because all the body language that you're giving me is freaking me out, right? It's less about the, oh, I know that diving in the trash was wrong, sorry. They're not making that association, right? Instead it's a, you seem really mad, so I'm gonna give you all of these body language appeasement signals, calming signals to tell you I'm no threat, right? So you really have to look at the situation and be like, how do I prevent the unwanted behavior from happening in the future? What do I want the dog to do instead? How do I teach the dog do this instead? This is a better choice, right? And then if there is a consequence, it needs to be effective consequences. So interruption, less a consequence than an interruption. So if I have a dog who is having like a, a potty accident and I see it, I try to interrupt it, but I'm not correcting the dog for having it, right? probably my fault because I didn't let them out when I should have or watched for the signs that they needed to go be consistent in their potty breaks right all those things with potty training um I might interrupt the behavior so I might clap and try to get the dog to move away from whatever is they're doing um and then look at again the setup of the environment to prevent it from happening in the future teaching incompatible behaviors um it is hard for humans to effectively correct dogs um so so yeah, it's a good question, um, but it's it's hard to you know give you a full answer because uh, what I would do is I would look at what am I doing that's freaking my dog out, and then how do I prevent it in the future? Um, so bad, Kathy, right? <laughs> like I gotta fix my behavior to fix my dog's behavior. Um, all right, we've got um, another question that. Uh, I don't think we have time for. We have recorded a podcast on this, but Amy was wondering, um, oh God, it's really dark now, uh, what you should do when a dog comes running up to you off leash and the owner is not seen. Yeah, um, this could be a whole happy hour. Yeah. Um, U-turns, <laughs> this is where working on foundational skills, especially if you have a reactive dog, is very important. I'm trying to figure out how do I add distance. I turn and I walk the other way. I might throw treats in the face of that approaching dog. Um, I might have an umbrella with me that my dog is used to me carrying and used to me opening, and I might pop it open to try to get that dog to, to leave me alone. I will make a note. There's a great video from Patricia McConnell, um, who's a applied animal behaviorist, uh, where she kind of shows that honestly, like throwing chicken in a dog's face usually works to have them go <gasps> and they, then they start sniffing and then you have a chance to leave uh, right and add distance as you need if you have a small dog in more scary situations where the approaching dog um, is looking like a very serious encounter is about to, hap about to happen or you know your dog will react very um, seriously there's things like if you're a small dog you put them in the bed of a truck that might be nearby right or, or something to get your dog up and away from them but again remember if that dog coming at you you're now in the way if you're holding a dog and so you might get bit but there are things um, like spray shield um, that are made for approaching things that you want to keep away those are in very severe cases you need to learn how to use them correctly um, it's hard to use under stress if you don't have practice using them. Um, I've been to conferences where dog trainers are learning how to do <laughs> them, and we all suck the first couple of times we tried to hit a target. So imagine if there is a, an aggressive moving dog coming towards you and your dog trying, trying to get it. Um, there's also things if you carry an extra leash, is there a way for you to secure your dog to a fence or a post and get that other dog secured? Um, with a slip lead or something that you carry in case of emergencies and, and add distance that way. There's there's so many things um, that are dependent on each context. So I'll make a note to add the um, Patricia McConnell video as well as the Off Leash Dog podcast and article we have um, about that. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, and quickly, uh, how Nancy wants to know, how do you touch with a small dog when they can't reach your hand? <laughs> oh. I will use a target stick. Um, and, and they, yes, Anne has one. She has the telescoping one. That is the click stick um, that you can use. You can change the, the height that it is. And there's a clicker built in um, if you're using a clicker. 
Um, or you can use something as simple as like a, a wooden long cooking spoon, um, just some kind of target that's like an extension of your hand um, will work just fine. Um, it doesn't have to be your hand, but good question because they are so tiny. It's like, how do we reach you down there? Hmm? Awesome. Um, so um, I think uh, maybe this should be the last one. Um, uh, Kygo. Kigo uh, is back um, saying that uh, when they're walking with their neighbor's dog and Cello, the older dog barks more often and then Cello starts barking too. Uh, Cello, they can calm down, but the older dog seems to be focused on barking. Uh, Cello then starts barking again. So how should we resolve this issue? I would work, I would look at why is the older dog barking? right? Is it a habit? Does it, is it reinforcing for them to bark at the world? Are they barking at something in particular? Do I need to work on teaching them not to bark at a particular trigger? Um, is it because they're older, right? There's, there's changes we see as a dog gets older um, into their senior years. Um, that can be a sign of other behavioral and medical issues going on with increased barking. Um, lots of reasons for barking. So you'd want to figure out why is the older dog barking? Work on that. Um, it sounds like cello is just kind of like, you're barking, let's all bark, right? It's very, it's a dog thing. It's like when we talk, we talk to each other. Sometimes I talk to myself, but like, it's nice when you're talking with someone else that they, you know, add to the conversation. So it's normal for a dog to respond to a vocalizing dog with vocalization. Um, so keep up the work on, on refocusing cello when the, dog, the other dog starts to bark. What I would do is I would increase the frequency of reinforcement for staying quiet while the other dog's barking. What that means is that dog's barking, we say cello quiet, and then we reward you for closing your mouth and not barking. But if you don't bark for another second, yes, here's another treat. Another two seconds, yes, here's another treat. And that dog's barking in the background. So reinforcing longer periods of time frequently for staying quiet while the barking's going on can help extend that behavior longer so that they don't just go right back to barking again. Right. Um, but yeah, good question. <laughs> but yeah, it's like one dog barks and then every dog, every dog barks. Like with my two, he's like, I don't know what we're barking at, but I'll join in. So that's fun. <laughs> awesome. I think my family's going to come charging through the door in a second and ask for dinner. So <laughs> I think you did it. You did it all. <laughs> <laughs> but if anyone had any other questions, please feel free to email them to me um, so that I can answer them for you. Um, and we will have this video posted on YouTube tomorrow as well. And you'll get a follow-up email with resources about all the things we talked about, more in-depth stuff that you can dive into. And I'll include a lot of um, educational materials, books and things um, that I love because I am a behavior nerd, but are great deep dives into reactive behavior and can be really helpful if you have a reactive dog or an aggressive dog to start to understand the behavioral science behind it. Um, and kind of why we do the things we do when working to change that behavior. So, so you'll get lots of information tomorrow as we do it. But thanks so much for joining me, everyone. I hope to see you next month for next month's Yappy Hour. Have a good night.